All right, welcome to UC Santa Barbara's Innovator Story Series. I'm John Greathouse, and you can follow me on Twitter, at John Greathouse. Our sponsor tonight is Appfolio. So Appfolio is a homegrown Santa Barbara company that went public a couple years ago, um, now has offices all over the country, um, and they've really built an interesting, um, a couple verticals of software that enable small and medium-sized companies to improve their workflows, and that saves them time and allows them to make more money. So we really appreciate Appfolio support. Without their financial support, we wouldn't be able to film these and share these uh, with everyone on the internet. So tonight we have Shannon Jessup with us. Shannon is the CRO of Tapjoy. Shannon has a 20-year track record in sales and mar as a sales and marketing executive in the mobile space, in the internet space, and in technology, uh, technology companies. She joined Tap Tap Tapjoy in 2009 uh, to lead its sales efforts. Before Tapjoy, she was head of sales and business development at Commission Junction, another um, wonderful Santa Barbara homegrown company. Uh, and we love Commission Junction for many reasons. Um, it, it's one of the few companies that can say it beat Google at its own game. And we'll talk a little bit about um, that with Shannon. In 2002, Shannon joined a teeny tiny little startup called Expert City. We made, we made go to meeting, go to, go to my PC, uh, go to webinar, go to training. I, I've never had someone on the stage that I hired before. Um, I just haven't done it for a variety of reasons, but I've tried to get Shannon here for, for, for a while. She'll, she will verify that I've, um, I've had this on my agenda for a long, long time. She's very busy, she travels all the time. It's hard for her to, um, she has offices all over the world, so she's on the road a lot, but she was able to make it happen um, this quarter, which I'm really happy about. We hired her um, to really run our channel sales. We didn't even have, we weren't even selling through a channel at that point. But we, we said, this, this woman has the capability, she's done it in the past, go figure it out. And, and boy, did she ever. We ended up selling that company to Citrix. Uh, Shannon stayed for a bit, um, a bit after that sale and was able to run inside sales as well as channel sales at Citrix. And we'll ask her about that experience. Um, and she was one of the original members, uh, original founders of a company called B2Bstores.com. Was, she was the executive vice president of sales and marketing, and that company was crazy. Ended up having one of the, it might still be the shortest path between founding the company and going public of all time. If it's not the, if it's not the shortest, it's one of the shortest of all time. Um, and lastly, but most importantly, Shannon is a proud gaucho. She earned her undergraduate degree from UC Santa Barbara in economics, and maybe even more important than that, she met her husband at UCSB, and he is with us in the audience tonight. Let's welcome Shannon to our stage. Hello. Hello. Good to see you. Wow, so fun. I know. Isn't it fun when two friends uh, can come I up know, here? I know. This is crazy. I can't believe I'm your only first employee. Yeah. That's so, so weird. So Kim Colson last yeah. year was someone I had worked with, but she was never, you know, she wasn't on my team or anything, or she yeah, was in another she's department. Yeah. She's fantastic. And she is with what company? Appfolio. Appfolio, yeah. Amazing small, company. Small world. <clears throat> Appfolio, just to give Appfolio another, you know, credit here, like there's a ton of people that we worked with at Expert City that mm -hmm. are there, and they've developed an amazing group of people that, have been there for a very long time. I've referred them a bunch of people, like amazing company to work for. So if you're considering something in Santa Barbara. Yeah, so the original team, <clears throat> Appfolio's original team was many of the people we, Tons, we yeah. worked with. It's a great company. Well, Shannon, I wanted to start, because I know you, you, you were in this room. It was not a <laughs> classroom back then. No, I, um, I was trying to talk to Jim, my husband back there. Uh, the last time I was here, it was either watching Cypress Hill or Social Distortion. Because They're like, what? <laughs> They're like, who, what? <laughs> this was a bitch and bar back in the day. Yeah, this had been a bank a long time ago, and then they converted it into a bar, and they had this crazy thing with the drink specials. It, it was and, a you know. countdown, so if you got here early enough, it was four for one, and then it went back up to midnight. Yeah, it yeah. Was, it was But ugly. you never stayed that late. N no one could stay that late if you started that early. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, your kids are going to see this, so. Oh, my children. That's right. Remember that. <laughs> so because you were here, even though it wasn't a classroom then, um, I, want, I want you to go back in time a little bit. And the students often struggle with that first job right out of school. It yeah. feels so daunting. It feels so 
ominous, like, oh my gosh, if I make a mistake here, it's going to be the end of the world. The you, end, right? And yeah. it's not. But do you have any advice for someone that's facing, many of these students and, and people watching this will be getting a job in the spring. Any advice for what they should or shouldn't be thinking about, worried about? I, um, this might combine another future question, but sure. <clears throat> my head, <clears throat> excuse me, was lucky enough to have an internship with IBM when I was here at school, and I was the collegiate rep for UCSB and what you know, City College and all that. Um, so we were selling computers that were the <laughs> size of this table and 40 megabyte hard drives. Wow. And we were connecting to Prodigy, that was like the internet back in the day. Um, but that really helped me, and I was a, an economics major, and I was getting my double major in environmental studies because I was going to be an environmental lawyer and save the world and right, all this. Right. And then I worked for IBM and decided that I really like selling stuff a lot. So, um, And I, I, I stress that to students all the time, get an internship in a, in a in, I mean, it's fine to have odd jobs as a student, but get a professional internship where you can learn what it's like to be out there in, the, in, I, in your field of study, like whatever you think it is you want to do. I was super lucky because the way I found my internship was from my restaurant job. So mm. um, Eric Greenspan, yeah, who you know, right, right. he and I worked together at a place uh, that was a Mexican restaurant, and he was managing the internship program at UCSB for IBM, and he's like, oh, you'd be great. Mm. But it started with a restaurant job, you know, and I put my way through school, and I was a waitress and a bookkeeper, and then I worked for IBM, mm -hmm. you know, and had three jobs, and I, I, I do think that, like, there is absolutely nothing wrong with the restaurant or retail. I think that gives you so much experience with just interacting with the right. world and people. And, and things. you never know where it's going to lead. Like yeah, you, it could be anything. You right. network. You, you you know. Right. You... I started at a restaurant at a Mexican restaurant and worked at IBM because of somebody I met at the Mexican restaurant. Right. So. Right. And that's it. Sounds random, but that kind of thing happens all the time. If you have your eyes and ears all open, the time. And yeah. you're looking for those opportunities. Um, so you so you get your degree in in economics, and then you end up at Maricel. And it, that sounds like so. Uh, uh, that sounds like a big, stable-ish company. You were there five years, five-ish years. Mm -hmm. Worked in product finance and marketing. So, it, to me, it sounds like you got to do a lot of different things. It was, was that amazing. A good yeah. experience. Oh, it was amazing. So, um, Miracell was IBM's biggest reseller. Okay. So that's how I went from that to that. Got it. Um, and I ended up started running the IBM business for Miracell. And back in the day, this is when we were shipping big computers and software came in a box and you know yep. printers and ethernet cable like all this stuff that like isn't so relevant today but um you know ibm's a giant company and miracell was a fortune 250 five billion dollar reseller and i managed their ibm business um run that for a while i ended up running their hardware business altogether from the Manufacture, we call it product management. It's really running the relationships with all mm -hmm. the hardware manufacturers. And Hewlett Packard, who at the time didn't own Compaq, which I'm <laughs> sure you don't even remember. What's Compaq? Yeah, right, exactly. Uh, Hewlett Packard was a big uh, computer manufacturer, not just a printer manufacturer back at the time. And they had offered me a job, uh, and they said, oh, we'll give you your. Uh, MBA at Pepperdine and you'll work for us and all that and okay. so I said I'm gonna go do this and my uh, CEO said okay that's great but and this is where I always talk about your maybe you don't want to get your MBA right right right, right. Um, so my CEO at this fortune 250 company said okay don't go work for Hewlett Packard and get your MBA I'm gonna give you an MBA in practical terms here and I'm gonna give you a four year program and you're gonna do one year in each capacity. Wow. And it was like, I, I cannot thank him enough for that opportunity because now after running a finance crew, I can talk to any CFO and it's, it's a public company, like we were running all the things. So finance, marketing, sales and operations, like it was a, a true, real yeah. MBA and now I can talk in any capacity to anybody that I work with in those capacities and have some frame of reference that's really important. Well, so. I mean, I just got that sense from sort of, you know, reading about your experiences of it, that, that it was that kind of an experience. It was amazing. Uh, and I, I would, I think that's a good point for 
that first job and you're thinking about, we all want to jump into something specific and, yeah. but, but you really, never, you never know. Right? The more exposure you can have to these other departments, it's almost like the, like when you're in college and you're taking classes just to see if you like them. It's not always easy, right? You can't walk into your first job and say, I think I want to work in four departments. But there are opportunities that open up, like for, for you to help another department or maybe to get to know another department on a different level. Take those opportunities. <laughs> yeah, because any, Shannon's anything, right, yeah. having that in your back pocket when you're further in your career, yeah, I know a little bit about finance. Yeah, I know a little bit about marketing. So, so getting back to your early career, um, I found that interesting that you said you, you realized you really like sales. So, so that is the best skill to develop as a young person, whether you want to do sales as a career or not. But having that foundation, because selling is a part of so much of what Everything, we do. Yeah. Recruiting, raising money, <coughs> trying to get you know, business deals. I mean, it's on and on and on. Even inside your own company, trying to get people to persuade and influence them to, to go your way. So how did, when did you know? Were, were you selling stuff as a kid? Like, when did you realize, <laughs> this is what I want to do? I, um, I had always worked in like restaurant stuff in high school, which is selling for right, sure. Right. Um, and interpersonal stuff, and that's all good. But um, I think that after that trip at Mirasol, like, and my first gate out of being a manufacturer sort of rep, like we were the interface between all the manufacturers. Um, then they said, oh, we're putting you in finance. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, I don't right, know. Right. So I went from managing like 30 people who managed partnerships to eight financial analysts. And that's all we did for a year was, you know, that. And I think that, um, you know, from a sales perspective, I, everyone, I, I, I do this all the time. And I'm like, I can't sell, I can't sell. I'm like, of course you can sell. You, if you can talk to right, anyone right. and be, you know, and listen, it's, it's actually much more about listening than it is talking. And I think that most people think it's like, oh, I gotta go like glad hand everybody and yeah. try and right, right, card right. sell them on cars or whatever. But it's really much more about listening. Like if you can listen to anybody, you can sell. And selling, and as John said, like you may not think that you're selling, like my husband's here. <laughs> He's like, oh, I can't sell. I'm like, you have to sell all the time. You have to sell. He worked at Yahoo for seven years and had to sell to 15 different business units why they should use his, his function within the company. So although you don't ever think that you're selling, you're always selling. Right, yeah, even if you're not getting an order at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah, no. I mean, even everyone in this room, it's, it's getting your roommate to clean up the bathroom. It's, it's, you're always in this persuasion influence mode. Uh, you just don't realize it. So you might as well get good at it, and you might as well get paid to do it, right? Or, or get your professor to bump your grade. Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> don't do that. Don't do that, please. Um, not this professor. No. All right, so I'm going to go um, to a student question in a second here, but okay. uh, let's talk about B2B stores for, for a oh, minute. Oh, geez. That's a I know that's a long conversation. I'll try to keep it short. Is it, no, no, no. Is it still the shortest IPO? Is it still the... I believe so. Okay, so from founding to going in, public, in, in it was six months? In corporation to IPO, it was six months. Wow. And it, it was a debacle. <laughs> and so you, you, you were a founder. You were there yes. at the beginning. Yes. Um, was it hard to go from uh, Mirasol, which again was a Fortune 200 or Fortune 100 company. When you think about it now, like, was it hard to leave that safety of a big company and jump into the dot bomb, dot com, it wasn't dot bomb yet, dot com oh, world. Right. Um, I hadn't had any, I was 27, I guess, 28. Yep. Um, and, you know, there's, there's no, I'm not worrying about kids or mortgage or whatever, so yep. it wasn't. And I was going in with two really, really, really good friends that I trusted and we absolutely believed in everything we were doing. Um, okay, I'm gonna ask you a bit more about B2B, but let's take the first student's question. Oh, yeah. Hi, um, Hi, I was just wondering, how did your major in economics at UCSB help shape your professional future? And if in any way, does economics influence you and in your profession today? You use economics every single day, like supply, demand, all of that, like absolutely applies to everything. Um, but, it, you know, it, do, do I use it every day pr besides the supply economics concept that maybe you got in high school? You know, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, and then, like, there, there are just so many things you can go do in college. Like, 
that don't necessarily have to apply to what you do next. Like everything that you do now is not determinative of what you're doing next. So don't feel like you're stuck or you have to decide or there's so many options, yeah, you know? Right. So sorry, I don't know if that answered your question. No, I did, thank you. I appreciate okay. it. So, so getting back to B2B um, for a second here, I found a very catty and very rude headline from that oh, time period. But it was probably true, actually. It, 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 <laughs> it, it, so here was the headline, and then I'll, I'll give you a line from the article. B2B store, dot, and everything was dot com, which I, oh, yeah. still it's hard for me to read that. It's like, anyway, I'll read it the way they wrote it. B2B stores dot com, their vapor IPO and the trials and tribulations of the e-universe. I mean, is that a dated sentence or what? Uh, like yeah, the World Wide sure. Web or something. <laughs> but anyway, they're basically saying, you know, this is a sham. So then they go on to say, there's no general way to put it. B2Bstores.com looks like a Wall Street prank. What's next? Just give us your money.com? What was it like having that kind of media hate? It was, well, it was horrible after the fact. So just leading up to this, we yeah, were- Yeah, so let's go back. So you, you guys all start in earnest. You have a million dollars. We have a million dollars. We have a business plan. We like, I wrote the business plan. We're so in and it, it's combining all of our experience. It's our e-commerce guy from Mattel, all of my relationships with all of the uh, suppliers mm -hmm. and our founder or our founder, our investor, happened to be a guy who was in with like Granger and those kinds mm -hmm. of, you probably don't know what Granger is, but it's like anything from toilet paper to chemical yep. cleaners, like anything you'd use on a practical business. So the idea was, and we were competing with a company called um, office.com, mm -hmm. which was owned by CBS of yep, all things. Yep. Um, and so the idea was if you as a small business, and this is back before anybody bought anything on the internet, you as a small business could accumulate all of your buying power through us and we would negotiate all of these rates. And we had connected with 250 distributors, which represented 250,000 different products. And your accumulative buying power would come through us so that you as a small business could buy as big as a Walmart, ideally. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, it was a real business and we hired 80 people and we were profitable going into our IPO and we were 27 and super dumb. <laughs> so, <laughs> So we got in, we had, I had uh, an investor relations, I had a PR relations, I had an agency, we had a $12 million marketing plan, because at the time that's what everyone was right, right. doing, like huge marketing. Uh, we raised 50 million, our- 50 million. 50 million, yeah. You guys realize how much, that's a lot of money. <laughs> On nothing. Right? 50 million, yeah. not 15, not five. No, we raised 50 million in our IPO, and we're like ready to go hog wild into all of this. And our board, who was all buddies of the original investor, mm. uh, shut us down immediately and said, we are now selling the company for the cash and the shell. Wow. Yeah. So we had 80 employees and we we're ready to go. And they're like, no, you're not gonna do anything. How far after the IPO did that happen? Uh, did that shutdown yeah. happen? The shutdown was probably a month, and then we went through three months of selling. With so right after of... the IPO, a month after the IPO, wow. We and there weren't lawsuits? I mean, people must oh, have sued oh, the crap out of them. Yes. Afterwards, there yes. were huge, right, right. huge lawsuits. Um, and the biggest lawsuit was the biggest investor who happened to be Balmer's big investor in Seattle. Like okay. it was pretty right. crazy. Right. But we honestly thought we were building a company and hiring a team and I'm still super tight with everybody that worked there and we were able to keep them employed until everyone got a job. Mm, so it wasn't good. like a big right. hash layoff. But but um, I think everyone says, oh, what's your biggest regret? And I look back on that and with my friends who I'm still friends with that worked there and one of my best friends, Laura Goodsell. Oh, right, yeah, right, she right. Worked, That's how I met Laura Goodsell. She worked with me in another company. Yeah, um, great friends and we all really thought we were actually doing something but we were 27 and, and dumb. So. so if you're comfortable saying, what, what were people worth? Like what were some of the top people worth on paper at the peak? Oh, in the peak of that, um, not, not and oh well like me personally well just if you don't want to be personal no that's that's fine i mean on paper generally like we're retiring <laughs> it's 
going to be awesome. Eight, eight million dollars. Yeah. And think about that. 27, 27 years yeah. old, you're thinking, I got eight million dollars right now in the equity of this company. And as this company grows, it's only going to get bigger. Yeah. So I ended up after all the closeouts and when you go into a company, there's, um, what are they called? The holdbacks, like the retention. Right, right, right. Whatever. Right. You have to stay there That's for cool. X amount of time, all this stuff. So I ended up, um, after $8 million on paper, <laughs> I think we ended up with $125,000, which was great. It was a down payment for our house right, and all right, that. So right. it worked out fine. But man, like, we just felt like such idiots. Like, we were so duped by something we thought we were really building. Right. So. So experience is what you get when you don't get what you want, and you got a lot of experience. Ton, tons, tons right. of experience, no, and, I'm sure you and tons of great, you know, relationships and people, and you know, nobody blamed us for what right. went down, right. and and the founder, the board, the board, and all those guys ended up getting sued like terribly. Of course, <laughs> you can't raise fifty million and then shut the business. Right. It's yeah. It's ridiculous. So I assume that in your role was primarily cutting all those deals with the distributors? Yeah, Is that what yeah. You did? I had the, the sales side. We did an OEM kind of thing where we'd take the entire storefront and put it in somebody else's name uh -huh, yeah. so they could have their own, like, you know. Get on the web. Right. I remember those days. Yeah, yeah. so we were OEMing the whole B2B storefront, and then uh, we had a big marketing team, certainly customer service. and. Operations and so you got that. some management experience, you got more BD experience, and all of these things, all of these things Shannon built upon as her career progressed. As we as we keep going here, you're going to see how all of these things came back to help her. Even the failures, or even the things. Fa didn't failures are good, honestly. You, you yeah. learn as much or more from them. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about mentors. So was that uh, was it a man? I think you used. He is yeah, it a, he, that was a guy. He's great. So talk to talk to us a little bit about mentoring. But I what I specifically want. What I'd love to hear your thoughts on is what did the mentors teach you about mentoring? So when you when yeah. you're mentoring people now, what are you drawing upon from your mentors? So um, my first mentor, not John, who's oh, been an on. amazing mentor to me, sir. Um, uh, my first mentor, he was an MIT undergrad and a Harvard MBA. Wow. And I came out of little UCSB, which at the time does not have the stature that it does today. Congratulations, thanks for making me look much better. <laughs> um, but he, uh, he was the one who said, don't go get your, he's like, look, I'm gonna pay for my Harvard MBA for the rest of my life, right. and I can educate you in all the things in a practical aspect that's gonna be way better than anything you're gonna get in an MBA program. Um, and he's st he and I still are super tight today, um, and he's been amazing. And I've been really, really lucky across my whole job fair that um, I've had really great mentors, in including you, of course. So, what when you're mentoring people now, like, what do you do? You, do you think, oh, this is something that one of my mentors would have said to me, or does, does I, that um, come to mind, or is it just you're sort of intrinsically pulling from that? No, I, I, um, I mentor a ton of people in both previous jobs and current jobs. And um, what people I- People were always very loyal to you. Like when they worked <sighs> for you, they were super loyal. Yeah, I, um, in my current but, job, I have like four or five people that I've worked with for like 15 years now. So um, there, is, there is something about building a team and a crew and a family and all of that. But I, I love mentoring the young, young ones. Like, right. You know, straight out of school, I can't tell you how many straight out of UCSB people we've had that are now director of VPs at Tapjoy, um, and I I love that. I I find challenging a little bit. Like I have a couple people that I'm trying to mentor, and I am very like go with the flow, entrepreneurial, like whatever. And they're very very black and white and in a box, you know. Mm -hmm. So that that's where I struggle a bit, and I think that. N nothing is ever what you think it's going to be. Nothing. Like, you may have preconceived notions about your your job or your life or your whatever. You know, and yep. and everything everything changes. So just be open to everything that comes to you. And it's just all the things outside looking in are just not as impressive on the inside, right? You oh, think for of these, sure. <laughs> I'm not going to name any names like Wharton. But oh. you, <laughs> these venerated institutions that you think are just so amazing, and then you get there and you're like, these people are knuckleheads. Like, there's, there's just nothing that special. Well, it's so funny because now in San Francisco, 
I have a ton of Stanford MBAs that work for me. And it's just sort of a thing if you're in technology in San Francisco and you're a Stanford MBA. And before that, because you know, I have a ton of Harvard mm. MBAs for mm -hmm. whatever reason. Um, but I think that although that gives you tons of very you know, academic, great knowledge, it's not, it doesn't allow you to, it doesn't make you a better manager in terms of working with people right. or, and it can like or, or, or a coworker, like right. how do you work with people? Like, I, especially the Harvard guys, it was like, I don't really want to work on that. I just wanted to work on the strategy. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. that's not really a job. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't pay the bills. No, you have to actually do the work. Ring <laughs> you, the cash register. You have to strategize at night. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Do that on your time. Sell on my time. So th you, then you went to Epic. So is that pronounced in Paris? Yeah, right? yeah, Epic. Epic. Uh, Epic Internet, one of the largest internet service providers in the nadir of the nuclear winter yeah, that, that followed was, that the, was the bomb crash, right? <laughs> yes. So <laughs> you found yourself there in 2002 and you were building, you were doing marketing and you were, you were doing some channel stuff. Like, did you really get to do any fun marketing at that point? Or was there like no budget? There's no, no budget okay. at all, none. So, and um, so the fun thing that I did was that because I had done so much marketing at Miracell with all of the vendors. So think of like, I don't know, Coca-Cola working with Walmart, you get co-marketing dollars. Mm -hmm. um, and that's all the marketing. I had $80 million of co-marketing dollars at Miracell, which wow. is amazing. Um, here, they hadn't done any of that, but they're still reselling all these guys' products. Mm -hmm. So I went to Sun and IBM and EMC and yep. you know all these guys back in the day, the storage guys, and they had I had no marketing dollars, and I ended up getting in my first year ten million dollars in co-marketing dollars from nice. all those partners. Nice. So it gave my marketing team, which was like I don't know what to do, stuff to do. And then we were um, training and selling and things because it was all through channel partners there right. as well. Right. So just to be clear, that's like ten million dollars of free money. Free money. Yeah, it's getting free. somebody to basically give you that money to do marketing for your own company. Money they would have spent directly on TV or print or. Right. Right. airports or and outdoor, you and whatever. the salesperson and you was able to convince them no give that money to me and we'll both be better off yeah so we'll get all of our partners right. to resell your products and train them and we had you know we spent it on like reseller conference training and things like yeah, that yeah that's so. brilliant i love i always love co-marketing dollars yeah co-marketing dollars are great wherever you have another partner they always have marketing dollars they can always give them to you so. yeah but i've always been sort of that small company partnering with a big company so you lop onto their trade show booths and you just yeah, every so, every yeah, opportunity everything. you can everything you can do with anybody else oh you spent five hundred thousand on that booth hey can i just stand on the I'm side i'm just gonna and, stay over here i'll just i'll be out of the way a little sign on the top <laughs> <laughs> So we'll take the next student's oh, question. Hi. Uh, what do you see as the biggest challenge in the mobile advertising industry? Mobile advertising today is really run by Google and Facebook. Snap, I thought was going to be a com big competitor. But they've, they've done pretty poorly. And I, I know a bunch of people over there and respect them. But they haven't been able to monetize the, the audience there as well. So Facebook and Google are really running 92% of the mobile marketing industry right now. Um, and so that's probably my biggest challenge, but it's also my biggest opportunity because all of our partners really hate Facebook and Google. So, right, right. Um, so uh, we're working with King and Activision and EA and other guys to say, hey, Gaming is where people spend, I don't, I hope you all play mobile games. Yes, everybody. <laughs> um, this is where everyone is spending their time. So, and, and we do a bunch of like bio, you know, analysis on how do you feel while you're on Facebook versus how do you feel when you're playing your game and everyone is sad and <laughs> angry <laughs> and angry and jealous and yeah, whatever right. on Facebook, everything is social. And you know, while you're playing games, you're relaxed and whatever. So gaming time spent is 32% uh, right now, and then socials 30%, and then sort of media, like news and things like that, is the other 30-ish. Um, so we're really working hard on a coalition to get anything but social 
because Facebook owns everything and then Google owns you know, all the search aspects of things. So um, from a mobile perspective, those are kind of the two that are challenging. Um, but at the same time, they give us so much opportunity because everyone wants an alternative. So what, what do you, you think, we can talk about Thing for a second. If Thing yeah. is Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Netflix. and Google. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's incredible, like the dominance that they have right now. Do you, I don't want to get political at all, but what do you think's going to happen? I mean, I don't think they're, if we don't do something, I don't think their dominance is going to go down. No, I don't necessarily think it's going away. Right. However, they're all clients of mine. So. I we, know we love them. I personally, oh, jeez, sorry. No, we uh, all love them. We all use their products. We all use their services. No, but they're all, they're all clients. So they are all looking for new users on my platform. Got it. So although I am completely 100% dependent upon Apple and Google and some degree Amazon yep. in terms of the app community, um, at the same time, all five, six of those guys are advertisers in my platform to drive because traffic. they need more clients. And they can't get them through their own platform, obviously. So. Um, so I feel that while they're clients, it gives me hope that there's always something else. At the same time, you know, if Apple makes any kind of change, it runs through my right. whole world. Right. Um, so, at, and when I first started, we were actually all Facebook. And then that was when we were web only. Um, so Facebook was dictating our, and that was just one. At least now we have Apple, Amazon, and Google, so. What, why do you think, um, uh, I, I understand it's a two-sided market. It's not easy. It's not trivial to start an app market. But why do you think there hasn't been like another dominant, or maybe from China? Or from so China, I think, has a huge opportunity. Sony, Sony, all the all the eight the telco platforms and the hardware manufacturers have all tried to do something on their own. We're working with um, Ericsson on some interesting stuff because Ericsson is the hardware behind a whole, most phones. Right. Um, they have all the data. AT&T, mm, right, you know, right, all, right. all those, Verizon, all those guys, I, they are, and, and you and I have worked with them, you know, in yep. the past with Expert City, right. they are the slowest moving things on the pretty planet, much, pretty much. but they are also hugely influent, they're like the tectonic plates, like slowly moving, yep. but they do control that much mass of things, and the data, the data I think is the more exciting part mm -hmm. of that, um, so Working with those guys is almost more interesting. And to your question about uh, Apple or, or Fang and whatever, I think that the telcos, although they are crazy slow, now that they're controlling all of the communication things as well in terms of DirecTV and, mm -hmm. and all that, um, I think there is an opportunity for those guys to come, you know, take. Google and Facebook and those guys kind of head on because they're mm. controlling all the other aspects of your lives mm -hmm. that aren't necessarily mobile. So there might be a little bit of counterbalance. Slow, for sure, but the amount of data and uh, connectivity and clients that they have is equally as large. Right, good. That's good news, I think, for everybody. Um, so let's keep going. So Epic was Epic and, and it wasn't that Epic. It was. You wanted to get back to Santa Barbara, if I remember yes. right. I remember interviewing you in a conference room and immediately saying, this is my revisionist history, but I remember, that's how I remember it. Like, I just immediately said, we have to hire this person. And is our, I don't, had we started channel sales? I don't think no. we had done anything, right? No, nothing. You no, probably convinced fun. me and made it my idea that we should do channel sales. I don't even you know. You did like a how. Jedi thing, and, <laughs> and I walked out going, we must do channel sales. Well, so just to end on Epic, Epic uh, closed its doors. We had no idea. Closed its doors, maintained 30 people in like the knock, you know, mm -hmm. the, maintaining all the stuff flowing. Um, My husband's company was like YouTube before it was YouTube. They had a camera in the top of Burning Man in like 2001, like showing live video. Right. Anyway, they closed their doors. We both lost our jobs within a week. And we took our two kids, who were two and six months at the time, and went to Mexico for six months and just traveled around. Oh, and wow. It was awesome. And then we came back, and there were still no jobs. Um, 
And we said, well, where do we want to live? Because there's no jobs in LA, and we don't necessarily really like LA. And we said, right. well, hell, let's move back to Santa Barbara. Right. And that's when I. Yeah, you met must you. not have told me about the six months in Mexico, because I would have been. You're a hippie. Get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm sure you told me. Was it Scour? What was the company that you were with? Scour. Popcast, okay, because Scour was another one that looked like yeah. it was going to be YouTube before YouTube, and then it just went. We, it was down. like obviously a great idea. Yeah, but and a little too early. Little too early. And the bandwidth costs were so expensive. Yeah, time. video on the internet. Yeah, it makes sense, but maybe not in 2002. So we were lucky enough to hire you. As I remember, we really didn't have the right product to do no. two-tier distribution, right? So our price point wasn't right. Well, no one had ever done it was a subscription. anything that was subscription model and or not a box. So what right. do you remember about those challenges? And you were on the front lines. I was you know, not on the front lines of that. What do you remember about those challenges? And what did we do to try to overcome them? Um, we were trying to re-educate people about how to buy software. Yeah, really, like how it was twofold. Like one, it was go to my PC before there were laptops. Like really, no one had lap like right. the laptop was as big as this table again. Yep. <laughs> um, so no one had laptops. So if you were going to work from home, it was PC to PC kind of thing, and you know there there just wasn't any of that. And um, additionally, all these resellers like you couldn't buy hard, there wasn't Best Buy that you could go in and buy a computer. You know, right. you, you bought computers from resellers, especially in a B2B environment. Um, and they also had no way to support any of that unless you were gonna go send a dude on site to everything that you were supporting. And there weren't really like inside IT people at that time. Yeah. It was, and the price so, point didn't support that kind of a rolling a truck. So the product was actually really perfect for all these resellers who were putting out hardware and software and everything and how to support it and how to get remote access for remote clients and things. So it was perfect timing, but it was such a strange concept for them to be like, Okay, where's the box that I'm gonna right. put on the thing? Right, and right. yeah, it was completely new. It was it was changing um, just the way people thought about software. And as I'm hearing Shannon talk here, I'm just remembering some of the things because I literally didn't know anything about channel sales before I met you. And if you want to be successful, hire smarter people than you. Seriously, <laughs> because I remember Shannon would come to me and she's like, John, we need to do we need a website for our you know, for our distributors. And I'm like, well, talk to me about that. Explain that to me. And you just basically explained Channel Sales 101. And I would say, wow, that sounds like that makes a lot of sense. Why don't we do that? And then you would go off and we had money and we were doing pretty well. It was great. Um, so you were, able to, you were able to build all the support tools and go out and do, and, and do channel sales, right? And I, we did a bunch of like remote training and, you know, I knew most of these guys from my previous experience at Marisol. Right. It was a pretty small community, but we were able to sign up a thousand resellers within the first year it was pretty great. Right. Um, and we grew that business within like a year from nothing to 20 million. So I know, that's that crazy. pretty great. Yeah. yeah. We were, those were rocking times. It was fun. There's not that yeah. many companies that, I mean, I'm, I'm involved in a lot of great companies, but I was talking to Brett Kane, who we're also friends with. It's just those kind of successes are, they don't happen every week, unfortunately. Um, so we had a really good run there. Then the company was sold. I left after, I don't know, four to six months or something. I sort of said, here you go. Yeah, um, I stayed on and you another stayed. two years. A couple years, years right? Almost, yeah. So what was that transition like? So you ended up getting more responsibility, which is great. Yeah. You took on inside sales. Well, I had started inside sales maybe oh, before, yeah, before okay. we got bought. And we only had a field team, and they were run by this great guy, Chuck, who's amazing. Um, but we didn't have an inside team, and where product was kind of transitioning more from an enterprise thing to more of a SMB thing. Right, right. Um, I'm like, I run huge inside sales teams at Marisol. I'm like, just give me a couple people. And uh, I started with three, and we ended up with 30 before I transitioned up to I Albert. Forgot that. Yeah. I forgot that you started And so, that. Okay. yeah, we en ended up doing 20 million in the first year of that whole thing. See, too. that was one yeah. of the most successful inside sales teams I've ever worked with. And I've worked with some really successful Well, the ones. product, definitely. The product was good, but Fit, we yeah. know people can ruin a good product, too. <laughs> I had forgotten that you started that. Yeah, so, yeah. did you, you probably came. You probably came to me and said, we should be doing this. Yeah, I came to you. And being and brilliant, you, I said, you're right. Of course we should do this. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's when we had like three folks. Nice. Um, and one of them, you know, was uh, Brett's son-in-law who's now oh, really? was CRO of New, Re everything. New Relic. And I've forgotten that, everything. Yeah. 
I don't remember anything there's, about anything. There's tons of, they all started here and. Well, then, then Albert Oden went on Albert. and had a very successful career. And all these people you guys don't know, um, very, very successful. Because you were a good, a good mentor and a good teacher. Um, but what, what, how did that? How did the dynamic of the company change? Because we went from being able to do yeah. whatever we like. You could walk into my office and say we should do inside sales, Let's and I'd say this. okay. And then it changed. And how did you deal with that as an entrepreneur? So um, Brett was running it at the time, and he said, "Okay, inside sales gotten too big, and channels too big. So do you want to run channel and integrate with Citrix? Because Citrix didn't have any direct sales folks. Right. It was all through partners. Right. Or do you want to run inside sales? And I love inside sales, but it does become, after a time, like very yeah. process. Like yeah, it's yeah. like, as long as you adhere How to many calls things, did you make? Yeah. yeah. How many calls? You're fired. You're <laughs> hired. <laughs> it's a very, you know, Up cut, around. cut and dry. Where channel is, you know, we expanded to LATAM and Europe and Asia. And that was even before Citrix came in. Oh well, no, I guess it was mid. Like we were in the midst. And so since Citrix was all channel, Brett kind of said, hey, will you help be our interim person to try and meld the companies together? Right, I remember that. And they, because they had their own channel. They had their own huge, right. huge, right. huge channel business. Um, so I worked with Brett and with, um, Gosh, I'm sorry. The I don't remember the VP of sales and, and Mark, the CEO of yep. Citrix. And I, I worked with all of them to try and figure out how we could merge it all together. But Citrix really wanted Expert City to be all channel. Yeah. And Expert City really wanted to stay in Santa Barbara and grow to be a big direct company. So it was definitely challenging to try and bridge those two because there was, we want this yeah. and we want this. and. You know, uh, in hindsight, I think the Breton team did an, an amazing job of justifying why Expert City needed, a, and it's go to meeting and all that, why Citrix Online needed to be a direct sales force and grow versus being absorbed into the Citrix It would have destroyed it. It would have killed it. Yeah. Absolutely. It would have been the it classic big company yeah. acquisition. But it turned out to be one, one of the most successful acquisitions, I'd say, of the 2000s. Absolutely. If you look yes. at what they paid and what that company was worth oh. after, oh God, it was worth yeah. billions. For sure. Billions after that. It became the third largest software and service company. You know, and when we were bought, and I mean, when I started with you, I think there were, I was the 17th person at oh, Expert really? City. It was crazy. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, then when we were bought, we were maybe 200. Yeah, 220 or something yeah. like that. And then, you know, then when they were then again bought, I think there were close to 1,200 people oh, yeah. out here in Goleta. Yeah. So one of the biggest employers in the county outside of government and stuff. Yeah, you go from University. 17 people to 1,200 people employed here in Santa Barbara. It's pretty, yep. pretty amazing. Yep. And they're still out there. Log Me In is the new, yeah, new yeah. company, so they're still helping the community. Um, we'll take another Scott's oh. question. Hi. Hi, so while you were at Miracell, you mentioned how you've held positions in sales, marketing, project management, and finance. And my question is, how are you able to work yourself into and really adapt uh, to so many different aspects of business so early on in your career? Um, yeah, I, I mean, it, I think the question goes to also like inheriting teams. Like, it's really hard to come in, especially either as a peer or a new person to come into a company and say, oh, I'm your new boss. And especially coming into that, I'm like, oh, I'm a salesperson, now I'm gonna run the finance team? Like, that's crazy. But it, it honestly, it, it really comes down to me, uh, to humility. Like, you gotta know what you know and don't pretend that you don't know what you don't know and listen and respect everybody on your team and everybody's opinion matters. And although I may have you know, be able to help in managerial stuff or help like negotiate upwards to things or help you get what you want personally, you're gonna educate me on how the hell this finance stuff works because, you know, I don't necessarily know. And then, and then going in from, from the finance team, I went in and took on 80 marketing managers. And I'm like, yeah, I've done some marketing, but I don't know this. And it, it really is about, you got to come in and say, I don't know anything. I've got some strengths that I hope can add value, but you guys are going to have to teach me and I'm going to make sure that you guys are wildly successful. So 
Um, it's about building, being really, really humble and building trust. Thank you. That yeah, that's a great combination. Yeah. And I, I'd like to think I tried to do that. Absolutely. I mean, I wasn't yeah. kidding when I said I didn't know anything about channel sales or anything. Um, but I always felt like my job was, I loved hiring people like you because you're so autonomous. You didn't need to be managed. Like I was a horrible manager, <laughs> but I didn't have to be a good manager because I'd hire great people and they would just go off and execute. Yeah. And if you came to me and said, hey, John, you know, I need a resource, I'd try to get you a resource. But I wasn't, I wasn't like coming up to you and going, so well, let me manage you today. But speaking of management, how would you describe your management style? Because you do manage people now. You have a big team. Big team. You have a big responsibility. You're driving a lot of revenue. How would you, or how would you, how do you think one of your, one of the folks on your team would describe your management style? Um, I'm definitely not a micromanager, um, but I am a, I, I want to know all the details. Like I am very detailed, get on the weeds. I want to know every aspect of everything. Not so I can tell you what to do, just so I can understand what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, so every time I take on anything new, I'm like, okay, train me as if I'm a brand new first person in. Um, I think I'm, I'm definitely gray, which drives some of my, my VPs crazy. I have a couple of VPs who are very black and white and we need mm. defined things. And that, that's I'm the, like, I think that's the entrepreneur in you. Yeah. We'll figure it out. Yeah, we'll, and you, we'll we'll we always do. It it's fine. Don't worry. Don't worry. Ambiguity is great. Embrace it. Yeah. And yeah, <laughs> I, I love that. <laughs> drives some people crazy. Yes. Um, but I, I think that, you know, as much as you can hire and trust or promote and work as a team, I am like, incredibly team oriented everything is done as a team and i'm also incredibly competitive so as long as we can all work together and everyone's getting along i don't tolerate politics or strife like that has to be nipped in the bud mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. one second you yep. don't let that yep. go on at all yep it's cancerous it'll just it'll yeah. just consume a company yeah and if you can't honestly if you can't if everybody can't work together then you got to change it because right. there's no making it work without everybody working together. I totally agree. So then you, you went to another cool kid in town, Commission uh, Junction. Yeah. So what was sales like at Commission Junction? I'm familiar with the company, I've worked with the company, but for you, what did sales mean there? Was it publishers you're focused on or advertising? No, or advertisers, it? actually. I, I did some of the publishing side, but mostly advertising. Um, so... Uh, Maybe we should explain what Commission yeah, Junction does. So, so Commission Junction, they're the company I alluded to that beat Google. Google had something yeah. called the Google Affiliate Network, and they shut it down because they just they couldn't compete with Commission Junction. They did because of it, us. Incredible job, <laughs> um, and not very many companies could say that that they went head to head and beat Google. So, so what the idea was: all these independent websites were out there. If they put an ad on the website, Commission Junction would help make sure they got monetized. That that, that ad got monetized. It fell, yeah. An affiliate. So. It was this wild west of the early days of the internet where people were trying to figure out how to make money on the internet. And two, was one UCSB graduate and, and another gentleman started that company here in Santa Barbara. And it became the largest affiliate network in the world. I, I think it, it still probably is, still is. Still is probably. So you show up in 06 or 07 or something. Well, it was funny. So my husband, Jim, had worked there for five years running all of their account management team, all their strategic accounts. That's like Citibank and like everything you could think of. Um, I left Expert City because he was going to Yahoo oh. and the CRO, which wasn't a title back then, she said, okay, great, go to Yahoo. Now I can hire your wife. <laughs> so oh, wow. Her. That's love. It, was, it, worked, <laughs> out, it worked out great. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, no, so um, it, they had, there's the internet retailer, which is kind of a standard in the e-commerce world. And so there's the internet retailer 500 and Commission Junction had 24% of those clients when I started and they had six field reps. And so then we built out a team of 24 in BD integrations because we had to, it's, it's quite intensive on right. the integration portion like, right. like Expert City. Um, and uh, BD integrations field and inside. And so we hired, you know, within the first year and a half, we hired 24. And within the first three years, we were up to 75% wow. of that, that 
portion. So right, right. We, had, we beat, we kicked Google's ass. And then Linkshare at the time was mm -hmm. bought by Rakuten, right. which is a giant Japanese company for not familiar with it. Right, so you were battling a Japanese conglomerate giant, and yeah. Google from little old Santa Barbara yeah, and you were yeah, winning. And we won, it was yay, awesome. Yay, yay. Um, so I know that you're incredibly driven. Um, you just said you were very competitive. Uh, and I asked this question of men and women. This isn't a question I reserve for women by any means. But how do you, because I also know that you, you are able to find time. Like you have a lot of animals, you have horses, you have <laughs> a lot of children, yeah. you have this needy husband. That, that we, keep, needy. <laughs> we keep referencing. No, but I mean, you, I, I, from the outside looking, you know, looking in, it seems like you've, you've achieved some sort of semblance of balance. You're, you know, you've maintained your sanity. Do you have any words of wisdom for younger people that are trying to figure that out? You know, because sometimes it, they over-optimize in one direction or the other, working too much. I think it goes along with the, the gray, you know? Like, you have to know when it's most important to be where, mm. and my husband... That's is, judgment. My husband is very much first, and then my kids, and then the company. And there is a way to make it all work. And so I was saying that Jim went to Yahoo. He went and worked at Yahoo in Santa Clara for the four years that I was at Commission Junction. And then I got this opportunity at Tapjoy, and we said, I, and it's up there, and he's at Yahoo, and I said, well, maybe we'll move up there. And he said, I don't wanna move up there. You can try it for six months, and if you wanna move up there after six months, then we can talk about it, but in that time, I'll flex my schedule so you can be up there more. Good. And we had three kids who were 10, uh, eight and five at the time. So, uh, you know, and, and in the previous five years, he had been gone most of the time. And it sounds crazy. And, and you know, a lot of people look at us like, oh my God, you guys are crazy. But it definitely worked. Like, um, I made sure and, and he made sure that we were here, you know, on certain days for school things. Like I did art on Friday every single day forever yep. while they were in grade school. And he did, uh, you know, eco um, electronical, like d building of things. Mm -hmm. um, so we made sure that we were here for all the really important things. But all of that is because, you know, after moving to LA and losing our jobs and being all over that we really want to be in Santa Barbara. Um, and so we figured out how to make that work well for us, I think. Right. Yeah, I always, I mean, I've written about it. I just published something recently about it. I really believe you should figure out where you want to live uh. first, right? We've talked about this. And then everything else will fall into place. So if you, if, you, yeah. if you sacrifice that, if you move to a city that you don't really like, but you feel like, well, I'm going to make all this money or I'm going to be so successful, it's like this is your youth. Like, don't sell yourself short. No. Like, figure out where you want to live first, and then everything else will will work itself. That was one of the questions. I don't know if it was a student question from today. I think it might have been one of the student questions. Is that your question? That was kind of the question that I had in mind. It was like, how do you know when to like move on to another opportunity? Or like, how do you know? Because a lot of times, as college students, we get like an internship, and then they offer it, and then we automatically accept it. But like, how do you know when it's time to like actually move on or try yeah. something new? Good That's question. Hard. I've asked him this like 10 times. I'm like, <laughs> I'm ready to move on. <laughs> um, well, so anyway, I was reviewing the questions today, and I said location is absolutely the first thing. And I'm like, maybe that's because I'm older now and I know that, but I think that had I known that earlier, like location means everything. Yeah, yeah it right. really does. Like you can always find a job, you know? And you can always find a job that with people you love and the money, it seems so important now, but I, I don't know. It's I, just, I, it's not I, as I mean, it's a bit of a trite cliche, but I do think the money follows your happiness. That's if you're true. happy, oh, sure. yeah. and if you're happy at work and you're building something worthwhile and you're working with people you like, you typically, the money, right? Unless you're a starving artist or something, it's gonna follow. So when you chase the money, I think that's when oftentimes when you get in trouble, instead of. Yeah, you know, you're just quite, never quite happy because everything else matters more, certainly where you live when you're not at your job is half your life, and then who you work with is the other half of your life. Right. So if you don't like who you work with in your internship, don't take the job, for sure. It's all, it's where and, and who, and then to me, the product. Those are the three things. So, <coughs> excuse me, 
you're happy where you live, you like where you sleep, you like where you wake up, you go to work because you like who you work with, yep. and then you can't sell and, and or engineer or build anything that you don't believe in. So if you don't have those three things, you should definitely look. Yep. But one thing, I don't know if it was you, maybe it was you. What's that? Um, might have been four. Some, I think it was John. They said, you can do anything for a year. And I do, I heard that multiple times in my job when I'm like, I cannot do this for another minute. Right, right. You can always do anything for a year if you see that there's light on the other end of the tunnel. Right, right. And there's a purpose to that year. You're not just, <coughs> you're not just you, know, you know, putting your head down and saying, I don't know what's next, but I'll do another year. Um, I, yeah, I feel the same way. I feel like once it becomes work, it really feels like work, then you should start maybe thinking about another place because there's lots of jobs that don't really feel like work every day. There's days that feel like work, but if it starts there's to be... There's days, months, there's whatever. There's always time. But right. Last question. Last question. So when you look back on your career, when you think about when you were a student, what, what, what advice would you have for any college student, but specifically our, our UC Santa Barbara students, what would you do differently? If you could go talk to young Shannon, uh, yeah. what would you shake her and say to her? And to get more out of her, what's left of her school. Okay, so not to knock the economics program, but I have hired, you know, people that were anthropologists or art history majors yep. and pursue what you love because your degree, unless you're, you know, computer science or something right. or biology or whatever, but all these arts are... Um, they're all applicable, everything is applicable, so pursue what you love. Like if I were to go back, I'd probably do philosophy, because I love philosophy. Oh. Um, and then specifically to UCSB, no one ever told me that I wasn't ever gonna live on a beach again. <laughs> so I lived at 6625 and 6636. Del Playa? Yeah, and please enjoy all of your time in the ocean, <laughs> because Chances are you're never gonna live this close to the beach again. Right. Um, I would I would go to school. I think that's different now. <laughs> that was back when they didn't go to class. We didn't have to go to class. I did I did work three jobs and put myself through school. So that was part of it, not going to class, but also part of kind of being lazy. But I definitely would, um, you know, pursue things that I was generally inter genuinely interested in, not necessarily because I thought it would help my future career. Um, you can you can go do anything. You know, like you can go from economics and go do anything you want, or you can be an art history major and do anything. So, don't feel like what you're doing now is absolutely. I, I just had this fear of, oh my God, this is gonna dictate the rest of my life, and and it's not. You have so many opportunities to do anything, but like really really enjoy it and. Enjoy all the people that you meet because they're going to be the friends that you'll have for the rest of your lives, and and a lot of people that you'll work with again. And you know, it's a super good time. And I know it seems stressful, but it's also something to really, really take advantage of. Yeah, relish it. Great. We'll end on that note. Thank yeah, you. Good.